and uh, the project Gender Equality Academy is uh, coordinated by, by Labs, uh, while the scientific coordinator is Yellow Window. And this is the, this is the, 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 the group of partners behind it. But let's come to our session and the reasons why we, that, that prompted us to organize it. That have to do with uh, the fact that um, uh, teams, teams implementing uh, gender equality plans in organizations or involved anyway with uh, institutional change processes are increasingly confronted with the need, the urgency to overcome gender binaries in approaching institutional change processes. To, to really go deeper and broader in understanding and working towards inclusiveness. And uh, this raises some questions we had, that's why we, we organized this. And uh, one obvious one is about what are the relations, differences and tensions uh, between the, the different approaches that indeed go beyond binaries. So intersectionality, of course, gender plus, diversity approaches are, and this can guide understanding, this can also guide the selection of one approach or the other if there are substantial differences. And sometimes this can be based on theoretical divides, sometimes more on opportunity considerations because every approach brings with it uh, some political, different political connotation, which might be differently received in different environments. And also when we speak, for instance, of intersectionality, there exist so many multiple interpretation and practices. And uh, for instance, uh, it is presented sometimes as a research paradigm or a research method or a theory or a set of practices. And it can really be all of these things. And what, are, what is intersecting actually? So categories, social groups, inequality grounds, or I don't know, identities. And uh, is this, multiplicity hampering the diffusion or the application of the approach, or maybe paradoxically improving, favoring diffusion and leaving some room for autonomy adaptation. Is this an issue or not? And last, but in this context, certainly not least, we know how intersectionality is powerfully capable of improving our understanding and analysis. Uh, into what in inequalities are actually. And uh, is it likewise effective? Can it be? And what are the factors that come into play if, this, if it has to be likewise effective in promoting practice, policies, uh, management uh, that are really intersectional and cross cutting So uh, now just skipping to the agenda, not to take more time. Uh, after this introduction, we will have short presentation in a row from our panelists. And uh, then uh, quite some time for discussion rounds that will be involved in the panelists among themselves with, with, with your input with the participants and a short wrap up in the end. And that's it for me. I just now have the pleasure to introduce our moderator, who's Dr. Eako Utoft. She's a postdoc uh, with the Danish Center for Studies in Research and Research Policy at Aarhus University. And indeed, uh, research interests cover uh, gender and diversity interventions in organization and gender dynamics in academia as well as in knowledge production. So thank you all for being here and Ea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for all for coming and uh, for the invitation from the Gender Equality Academy uh, to me for uh, to host this or to moderate this discussion today. I've been looking forward to it. Um, so uh, first, I just want to summarize a little bit uh, what your expectations uh, were and what you've been signing into the ex ante uh, questionnaire. So. Um, uh, from the questionnaire, uh, quite a number of you um, indicated that you're interested mainly in the link between um, gender equality plans and intersectionality. So this indicates to us that you're quite familiar already with, um, with change initiatives in, in research organizations. But you also want to learn more about designing and, and adapting gender equality plans to move beyond this simplistic a uh, binary gender perspective to take this inter intersectional approach uh, more than just a rhetoric of intersectionality, but actually uh, practicing uh, intersectionality. So here you stress, for example, race, ethnic ethnicity, LGBTQ+, and socioeconomic status. Um, and you're also very interested in the, con in the concrete links between practice uh, 
uh, or links to practice, which uh, of course I expect that we will get into today. But this is also, uh, as Marina said, the specific topic of our next session on Wednesday. So of, co of course we hope that you'll be joining us on Wednesday as well. Um, so finally, it seems uh, that you're very interested in, in knowing more about the theoretical link between intersectionality and its sister approaches, which, which is of course very fortunate uh, because that's why we're here today. And uh, so also this translation of these theories into interchange practices. And most of you say that you're uh, quite or relatively uh, familiar with the concept of uh, intersectionality. But for those of you who are new to this area, I hope of course we can strike a good balance in terms of the theory. And if you feel that something needs to be explained a little bit more, don't hesitate to let us know in the chat and we'll ask some clarifying questions when we get the chance. Um, and uh, don't, uh, in general, just uh, as Marina also said, ask the questions in the chat so that um, we can follow up on, uh, on the questions in the Q&A once we've had all of the individual presentations. And, uh, and also feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves, maybe to check in from where you're uh, dialing in from, let us know why you're, why you're here, what's your interest and so on. That would be really nice to, to get a feel of, of who our guests are today. And also you're more than welcome to uh, get social with us using either Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, Gender Equality Academy has profiles uh, in all of these uh, spaces. So do, uh, do share your thoughts along the way and we can look into to them afterwards, so that would be interesting. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers that we have invited for uh, the panel today. Uh, and of course, it's a pretty uh, stellar lineup, so I hope you're as excited as, as we are. So the first uh, speaker today is Mieke Fallo, who's a professor from Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and she's also a fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. So um, Mika's contribution to research is, spans uh, more several decades and uh, her achievements include, for example, um, the 2015 Gender and Politics Career Achievement Award, which was given by the European Conference on Politics and Gender. And of course, she has ample experience as a researcher, as a research leader, as an editor of books and special issues on gender, gender plus, and also gender uh, and opposition to gender equality and much, much more. So we're very happy to have you, Mika. Thank you for being here. Our, uh, our second speaker is Victoria Shavumni. Uh, Dr. Victoria is a lecturer at the Institute of Education at University Co College London. And she specialized in gender, identity, and race in the context of educational leadership and black women and girls. So she's here with us today because of her extensive experience with intersectionality in practice and research conducted in many different countries, uh, such as Pakistan, uh, Brazil, England, and the US. Victoria is further an executive member of the American Educational Research Association, the British Educational Leadership Management and Administration Society, and the Gender and Education Association. So in short, we're also very lucky to have Victoria with us today, welcome. And our last speaker today is Lisa Rolandsen uh, Agustin. Uh, we, have, uh, Le we have invited Lisa because she's an associate professor at the Department of Political Science at Olmo University in Denmark. She has uh, co-written and co-edited a number of important books, for example, Sexual Harassment in the Workplace, which is in Danish and from 2017, and the Gendering, Gendering the uh, European Parliament Structures, Policies and Practices, but I guess most relevant to our topic of today uh, for the round table, in 2013, Lisa published the book, Gender Equality, Intersectionality and Diversity in Europe. So thank you, Lisa, also for being with us today. So this is our lineup and the order of, speaker, of the speakers will be Mika first and then Victoria and then Lisa. And uh, you have, as we've uh, announced um, to you, about 10 minutes each. And we'll go all of the three uh, panelists giving their presentation and then um, have all the questions after that. Thank you all for being here. And it's my pleasure to pass the uh, floor to Mieke as the first speaker. Okay. So thank you very much for organizing this. I think uh, it's still uh, very, very necessary that many more people um, pay attention to uh, intersectionality when they try to change uh, organizations or society. And um, I do think this is a very complex undertaking. Uh, so that's also why I think in these 
complexity, we have to try to find some simple lines to see how we can actually uh, act. And um, the way, what, what I think is best uh, to keep in mind is not to, to start thinking from what um, you would need to achieve, but from what are you up against? And um, so if you want to uh, produce institutional change in academia, what are you up against actually? And, uh, and I think to, to see this problem that you are up against in an intersectional way is, is the first element that you would try to, to keep uh, in mind to, to make sure you're really working with intersectionality. And I'm trying to, to, to then pass along the ways, some of the ways that I think might be less productive to do so. So um, what, what, what is this trouble? What is the intersectional trouble with, uh, uh, in academia? What's the unequal intersectional regimes in uh, academia? So um, coming from gender studies in old school feminist words, uh, we could start by saying that academia overall and in different degrees and in different ways is patriarchal institutions. Meaning that it's organized in a way that gives different roles and positions in, to men, women, and to non binary people. And that this patriarchal organization of academia also permeates its teaching, its research, its procedures and processes. So the way everything it does is organized to work, how it decides, how it distributes its resources, how it selects its people, how it gives awards to people or promotions. So to say this would be true, uh, but also it would be true in a, in a very limited and even wrong sense. And that's where intersectionality actually comes in. Because we know very well by now that gender inequality or patriarchy, so I, I, I'm like putting the patriarchy, this old school word in there to, to make sure you keep in mind, not just the differences between men and women or something, or that there is not enough women professors, but that it is a deep system of inequality, right? And uh, so we have what we would call it gender regimes, but patriarchy is used by, her and by others also. And it, it keeps this at the forefront of your mind to say, okay, we're up against a system. And um, so we know very well by now the gender inequality or patriarchy is not the only inequality at work. So academia is also thoroughly, fundamentally, and has always been very class biased, um, advantaging the already materially privileged and letting the materially disadvantaged down. It is also deeply, fundamentally, and already for a long time and since it started, raised biased. So advantaging the already racially privileged and letting down the outright excluded uh, already in society by processes of uh, racism. So to look at advancing equality and justice in academia, we need to take action on these different inequality dimensions simultaneously. But, and this is important, this is where the understanding of intersectionality then comes in, also specifically, no? So, and I think I can, I can, make a brief excursion to the concept of gender plus to, to explain this. Uh, because I don't, I don't think all these different concepts that are used necessarily um, are um, indicating a very different understanding. People make strategic decisions about that. But when we started to use the concept of gender plus, and I want you to keep this firmly in mind, that the plus in gender plus doesn't indicate an addition. So keep in mind, if you see the plus after gender plus, please see an intersection, right? This, this plus is an intersection. So it is, um, I think also maybe you can see it as a wink, rather like this laundry detergent has now been improved. It is laundry detergent plus, right? It's better than what we had before. It doesn't mean it's added something. It's, it's improved. It's, it's, more, uh, it's more valuable. So it was a wink. Um, and we used the concept in the beginning uh, to, to make sure 
we would never forget that if we talk about gender equality, we shouldn't forget. It doesn't come alone. It is sitting in the middle of these other inequality dimensions, and those might be even more important. So, uh, and those might mean that for specific groups of people, the intersection of racism and sexism produces different results, because that's what intersectionality fundamentally means that you need to pay attention to the intersections of classism and racism, of classism and sexism, of classism, racism and sexism, of, you can add homophobia or, or other elements to that, to, to, to make sure you look at what happens specifically in this context that I'm working in and what do I need to pay attention to. Um, so it's not just that some people might have a, a combination of disadvantages or privileges, because that might very well be the case, but it might also be the case that they have specific uh, positions through the system of, of uh, inequality. And um, I think this, this is the, the most important thing to, to keep in mind. And, um, I, I, I think if you look at, um, at academia right now, um, there might be all sorts of differences that are specific for countries or regions or uh, specific types of universities. Um, but in all these cases, you can very well ask yourself, where do I see certain people that, uh, that exist in society and where are they absent? Not because that's the exact problem, but because they, this is an indication of what these problems of inequality and exclusions are producing. If I look at my own university, right? That's always a good uh, concrete example. Where do I see the students wearing a hijab? I see them in the law faculty. I hardly see them in the faculty of management sciences. I hardly see them in social sciences. So why is that? No? So this observation doesn't mean it's a problem. This observation means what that you should ask yourself, what kind of processes and procedures is this university having or these disciplines having? Uh, to produce this outcome. What is this outcome, the result of this? And if I look at that faculty, do I see equal numbers of male students that originate in these populations? And maybe I don't. And why would that be? Right? So, so this, is, this is the questions to ask. And this is what will give you an understanding of how the system of academia is working. So the, the um, and of course, a hijab is a very visible thing. Skin color is a very, is a very vis visible. Th these are very visible elements. Yeah. Other elements might not be as visible. If I look at my university, then one thing that we have managed to make the board see is that there is always a class base underneath this type of inequalities. There is a class base underneath gender inequality. There is a class base underneath and sitting within, within racism and race inequality. So they, they've decided to have a look at who are the first generation students in our university. And uh, as an indication of how, how classism permeates the inequality in, in our universities. So this is just my short introduction to, uh, to give you a sense of what it, what it might uh, do. And of course, the examples I've now been giving are about students, are about people, but similar questions you can ask very well, looking at the content of what is being teached, looking at the content of the research that is being stimulated or uh, produced in, uh, in, in a specific academic setting. These will give you similar kind of 
observations, if you look through an intersectional lens, that then will point you at the processes and procedures that you might have to change in order to uh, advance towards less inequality and more justice. And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel. Um, and now I'll pass the, the microphone on to uh, Victoria Shawunmi. Shavun, 10 minutes, I'll put my time on. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very excited and a little bit nervous about being here. It's a big, it's a big ask. So I'm, I'm going to look at it slightly different, but also build on what uh, Make, uh, Mika had said, which is I've called mine intersectionality and who am I? Because I think it's where it starts. So um, let's let's move on to this and um, see how we move to the next step. So I, I'd like to start with Patricia Hill Collins. And I'm aware, very aware that you want to have a mixture of um, what the theoretical part is and also how it's um, practical as well. So I start with um, Patricia Hill Collins to begin with and, I, and she talks about the oppressed groups and how they're fre frequently placed into situations of being listened to only if we frame our ideas in the language that is familiar to and comfortable for the dom dominant group. This requirement often changes the meaning of ideas and works to evaluate uh, sorry, rate the ideas of the dominant groups. I start with that because I think that is a key thing. And as I go through my um, particular presentation, I think that will help also to understand where I'm coming from. So let's hold on to Patricia Collins and let's hold on to the, what she said there. The oppressed groups are frequently placed in the situation of being listened to only if we frame our ideas in the language that is familiar and comfortable to the dominant group. So I turn it on its head. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of publications. I, I'm a bit, I don't really say too much. I'm always getting told I should tell more what I've done. But one of the things I would like to just share with yourself is now, what does it mean to me intersectionality? What does it actually mean to me? I suppose the biggest thing is acceptance of both gender and race is one thing, is that I'm a woman and I'm an also black. And that's difficult for people to understand because they want to put you in a box of two. Understanding that I may do things differently. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Moving on from that, I may not be the same as somebody else you know. Now, what I mean by that, oh yes, in your subconscious, you know how all black women are because you know one or two of them. Well, actually, we're not a homogenous group. So that in itself poses a question for yourselves because it becomes an un uncomfortable aspect of, well, I didn't think, I thought they needed to fit into this particular part. The pain I feel includes different aspects of discrimination. What I mean by that is the pain I feel as a woman is different to the pain I feel as black. The pain I feel as a woman and being black is the difference to fit, is what I feel of being somebody who has a disability. So it leads on it leads on to that. So that pain includes different aspects of discrimination. Being a black woman or black girl, depending who we're talking about, is particularly charged. Authenticity, autonomy, and inner strength is something what it means to me about intersectionality. Now, how did I come to that? I, I use this particular process and I do this with my students quite a lot internationally. I think that if you are really wanting to do work which, is, which has an intersectional approach to it or dimension, that's the way I do it, you need to take a look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself some mod, uh, fundamental questions. Who are you, number one? I don't mean who are you, meaning yes, I've got a personality and I sing and I dance. Or, no, 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 no. When you look in the mirror and you're asking those questions, who am I? You actually position yourself as somebody who is either white or black or Asian, whatever it is, but being a, having an honest conversation with yourself about who you are. And then ask it again, who am I and where do I belong is the next aspect which you also need to ask. And when you're looking at intersectionality, how does, it how does it present itself in your everyday life? 
is a, is a question I think which is very important. You need to ask yourself those questions as you do the work. You, you may decide to do one of these clouds where you just ask people to do um, a particular point and you ask them about intersectionality or you ask them about who they are. And then you put it up and you can start to see a particular merging and you can work from there. That's one way of looking at it as well. I'm going to go back on some of those slides if I have a, a, a moment later. So when I look at who I am, I come up with some images. I'm not the best at doing graphics, but of course you can see who I am because I'm visibly here. But in Zoom, the days of Zoom at the moment, you may not see who I am because I've actually, I may have just taken my camera off and I just then start speaking. And then you try to make all different uh, connotations about who I may be based on my surname. Well, what you don't know is I was adopted. I was adopted by Jewish German parents and I never lived in London at all. And I grew up in a, a purely white area and I didn't have that name. So, you know, a whole range of different things. Being a leader, leading people which don't look like me and the implications of what that means. In the implications for the people who are lead, being led by me and also for me as a leader. That's something which is very much part of intersectional way of looking at things. I'm a mother. I always use an elephant to describe certain things. And if you come to any of my work or you get to know some of it, it's something I use all the time. Being the elephant in the room and being in that room, most of the time elephants are kept out at the corner of the room as against inside of the room. Okay, so I asked one of my, uh, I asked my youngest daughter and she did this, well, she did this a long time ago. She's 16 now. She did this, she must have been about seven when she was putting herself forward to be voted for in her class. And uh, she's been to lots of lectures of mine all over the world. And just look at the things she decided to put together. We, we um, revisited that only recently. And she talked about all of this. And, I, and, we, and she said, oh, I, I'm, you know, some of these things, I don't know whether I'd, um, I'd say that now. I said, why not? You know, and I think that was really used, interesting for the, a child of that age coming up with those particular points, especially, you know, that uh, she's, she didn't mention anything about um, who she was as a young black child, but she did talk about all the parts which are part of her um, identity um, in, in a, a personality type way. If you go back to her now, she does talk about color quite a lot and she talks about being a young woman as well. So I just wanted to put that as, a, as an example on there. And I want to go back to this particular side, if I may, um, which is this one here, before I go to the end. Um, sorry, I want to go back a bit. So go right here, go here. So I want to go back to this, where I said intersectionality and what it didn't mean to me. And I really want to think about this acceptance of both gender and race. It means that that's powerful. That the amount of times I go to different meetings, whether it's to do with um, in, in Europe, whether it's across different parts of the world, where they talk about gender and actually what they're talking about is white women, whether it's to do with the statistics, whether it's to do with their, their experiences, it is about white women. Understanding that I may do things differently, meaning that when I'm actually using my hands or I'm doing something, um, people may get irritated because they think you need to do it in a certain way. Well, you know, who said you need to do it in one way or another way? And also, um, I may not be the same as somebody. I said that to you before, but I'm coming back to repeat that to you as well. This pain, I just want to focus on that for one minute and then I know I've, I've nearly finished. Um, I want to focus on one minute, the pain which we talk about as women is, is real. The pain what we talk about as black women is ongoing, it's ongoing and it comes from all different aspects. So the notion of intersectionality is not, I will repeat, is not about um, just a set of identities where everybody can be an intersect. This is about um, oppression, which is structural. Hence, gender and race coming together 
is something which is stru it's structural. I want to go back onto this one here, which is Kimberly. Now, Kimberly's work has inspired me, but before, and I'll read that in a moment, but before Kimberly, before Kimberly, um, there was also people like uh, Angela, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, Anne Phoenix, Nina Linky. I, I did make sure, I, um, I've, and I've worked with her uh, recently, well, a couple of years now, um, Nina Linky. These people were also um, people which have inspired me. Bell Hooks is really, really important to me. Now, Kimberly uh, uh, Crenshaw, intersectionality is an analytic sensibility, a way of thinking about identity and its relationship to power. Originality articulated on behalf of black women, the term brought to light the invisibility of many constituents within groups that, that claim them as members, but often fall to represent them. And I'd like to just stop there. And I hope that's given you a taster as we start our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for this very personal account. That was very, uh, very inspiring. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, I'll pass the mic on to Lisa Agustin from uh, Olmo University. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you. And very, thank you very much also for, for the invitation to, uh, to participate in this exciting uh, panel. Um, because I also want to um, to start um, from uh, yeah let's say the, the theoretical perspective and then move more into what is yeah what has been my my field of research which is uh, policy making and, and see how we we might um, yeah uh, work on some cross fertilization here between uh, policy making uh, processes and what uh, is happening in in academia. Um, so Marina, if you could go to the second second one. Yes, sorry, Lisa, I'm having a problem with in, in, uh, showing the presenter view, but for now, I go okay. to the next one. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yes, because I, as I said, oh, I want you. to start also... Yeah, that's perfect. Um, from from the theoretical perspective, um, thinking about one of the questions like what sets intersectionality apart, and I think what Mika and Victoria uh, showed already are some of these elements, right, that we would typically talk about um, in terms of uh, defining what is intersectionality uh, and also how it is uh, perhaps different, especially from diversity uh, mainstreaming. I very much agree, of course, with Mika's definition of what gender plus entails and what it what it is, um, not being something uh, different from uh, intersectionality sectionality but perhaps more um more a matter of where where do we sort of put the focus or where where are we coming from or where do we um where do we um yeah, what, what is the uh, what is the point of departure? Um, but to me, intersectionality uh, is or sets itself apart in terms of talking about power, uh, the the um, different elements, the structural approach that Mika mentioned, uh, also how we are addressing this from an, an integrated uh, perspective. So not talking about this as a sort of formal uh, exercise, but actually looking at how can we, uh, from the the structural perspective, uh, integrate these uh, ideas about intersectionality. Um, it's about uh, privilege, some of the elements, as, as Victoria mentioned, about biases, about uh, dominated group, uh, dominant uh, groups and, and uh, non-dominant groups. Um, what is sort of the critical, um, the critical discussion also of us versus them, um, and how do we bring that into uh, this debate also as we try to create uh, institutional uh, change. Uh, so questioning uh, privilege as well. And then finally, the transformative pot potential. So how can we precisely uh, attain this uh, systemic uh, change and what is the, the transformative potential that intersectionality offers perhaps uh, to some extent in, in contrast to, to other approaches to, uh, uh, to this field. So coming from that point of departure, theoretically, um, what I sort of wanted to ask or what I have been asking myself along with other co-authors um, in the work that I've done is what can we learn um, from intersectionality when we make policies? How can we make inclusive uh, policy making, not just in the products, in the outputs, but also uh, in the processes? So together with Emanuela Lombardo, um, we developed some quality criteria for good intersectionality. So basically what we did was to analyze EU policies um, um, and sort of looking for, um, let's say, hints on intersectionality and what would uh, good intersectionality uh, policy look like uh, in our perspective and, and from the analysis that, that we did. Um, so Marina, if you pass to the next one. 
Um, so these are the quality criteria that we came up with, and I'm not going to go through all of them because this is obviously a short <laughs> presentation. Um, but some of the things that we did find was, or, or we focused on, were this idea of explicitness and inclusiveness. So in terms of um, which kind of categories do we um, do we um, focus on, but also just the idea of having explicit categories in the policies, um, of course, is important, and it's it's important for for the output, but it's also important and simply for the way in which that creates a, a site of discussion or room for discussion uh, of these uh, aspects. Um, the gendering of the issues and the inequalities will also work with that, and that has to do precisely with the gender plus perspective. So the fact that we sort of take the point of departure in gender and consider gendering of issues to be important, but not stopping there. So going um, or moving uh, beyond that and looking at how gender intersects with, uh, with other categories and having that sort of, as, again, as an explicit articulation um, in the policies and explicit uh, consciousness uh, about what uh, happens here. The structural understanding, the awareness again of uh, the privileges and also the challenging of privileges within the policies um, are important. Um, and then the last two points um, is about avoiding stigmatization and that is sort of uh, the twin uh, sister. Um, of the first one about explicitness, because while we think it's important to be explicit about the different uh, categories, there's always ob obviously also a risk of uh, stigmatizing specific uh, groups um, and a good intersectional policy uh, would uh, try to uh, try to avoid that. I'm just going to go on talking. I guess <laughs> that the slides are jumping a little bit. Um, but uh, the last point on this list of quality criteria is the involvement of intersectional constituencies. And I think, as I said before, um, from a quality perspective, it's important when we sort of um, assess policies, evaluate policies, think about developing policies, that we're not just talking about the output, but also about the process, as I mentioned. So how can we um, involve um, different constituencies. And I think it's very important here to insist on this, first of all, this critical discussion of us and them, so who are making the policies and, and who do we sort of want to include, if you like, in the policies. And being aware of, I think that when we actually developed uh, this approach, uh, we were actually thinking more, again, of, of uh, from a policy perspective, we were thinking more about involving civil society organizations, civil society organizations that would represent different minority groups. But I think the way this is developed, and also I, this is uh, from five years ago, so I think it's very important also in the academic context that we think about involving constituencies, again, also from the privileged perspective, right? Precisely to overcome this distinction between us and them or try to overcome it um, and uh, include uh, different groups, different people in these processes. Um, it's very important that we don't think of this only as, um, let's say, involving minority constituencies, but also involving uh, precisely um, uh, privileged groups, etc., because we have to challenge uh, challenge those uh, those privileges. So um, this, if you go back just one slide, Marina, if if, uh, <laughs> if you can, um, that what I think I would or what I would like to to sort of add to this list of the quality criteria that we made for inclusive uh, and intersectional policy making is this combination of policy fields, which I think is very important because what we can see, and, and again, taking the point of departure in what the work that we did on EU policies and then coming, I will come in, sort of I will reach also the point about how to use this in academia, but just to take this as a point of departure, because what we found was that the EU policies are better at doing intersectionality when they very uh, explicitly combine different policy fields. It seems that it's easier to see uh, the intersectional dimensions, the intersectional um, implications uh, when we are working across policy fields. So in this case, uh, the policy fields, um, or this is an example about migrant women and how um, in an EU policy, they articulate how they're more vulnerable to violence um, and how their legal status, I mean, they're vulnerable, um, uh, that is sort of the point of departure of the policy, but the policy actually also reflects upon the fact that the legal status puts uh, migrant women in a in a position um, where they have, let's say, further vulnerabilities in terms of not being able to uh, necessarily um, go to the police, seek uh, shelters, etc. Yes, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, so um, what we see here is this combination of the gender equality policy field, anti-discrimination and immigration, which sort of makes room for or makes it possible for the EU policymakers um, to discuss different inequalities, so gender, race and legal status. And then the final slide um, is trying to bring this then, as I said, into um, the field of uh, higher education and, and academic uh, institutions, because I think what we see here is a, is a similar kind of um, perspective, but perhaps thinking more about then how to develop these policies, how to develop good intersectional policies, and precisely how thinking across policy field can help us do that. Um, and I'm referring here to work done by uh, Rosa and uh, Clavero um, from last year, where they talk about about how um, academic uh, work has become increasingly stressful um, and how that perpetuates also gender inequalities. Um, so um, we have some thoughts here about how um, female academics are um, sort of yeah, suffering from this, how their work-life conflicts uh, that are also uh, accentuated uh, for female academics, and how, as uh, the authors say, women are especially concentrated in the most undervalued forms of precarious work in academia. Um, of course, there are a lot more nuances to, to the argument here, but my point would be, again, about how we cross here different policy fields, because what they're actually talking about is, of course, gender equality policies, or what would have to sort of address what we would need to do to address these issues in academia. We would have to look at gender equality policies, work-life balance, contractual frame, frameworks as well, and also early career initiatives. So we would have to cross these different fields in order to actually get to the point about the intersectional, um, the intersectional dynamics here. And that those intersectional dynamics have to do with gender, of course, it has to do with care roles. And of course you could say, okay, but care role is not one of these classical inequalities that we typically talk about. Um, but care roles has to do with gender, it has to do with class, it has to do with a lot of, of, of uh, these inequalities. And that's why I sort of also mentioned it here. The same with contract status, we can easily relate that as well um, to issues of class, for instance. And then of course, uh, age as well. So I think these different inequalities come to the fore and they are sort of visible when we try to think of this um, in this combination of different policy fields and how that again then makes it necessary um, to have precisely this integrated um, approach that I talked about before. So when intersectional uh, work wants to actually create systemic change and wants to do that uh, by using an integrated approach, we cannot uh, look at just one policy field to advance in these issues. We have to combine them and we have to try to see uh, how they intersect as well um, and how they bring to the four different uh, intersection of different inequalities. So thank you for now. Um, and then uh, I think I might open with a, a icebreaker from my, from my part. Um, so I think uh, there's a tendency uh, for uh, people in Europe perhaps to think that intersectionality rings very American. So like you also referenced, uh, Victoria, you referenced uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill, Hill Collins. Um, so the, the term was coined there. Uh, and so I think that they, we may think about how to um, translate intersectionality or look at it as, as some ideal that we should strive to, to replicate or mirror one-to-one -one in the European context. So I wanted to, to open with a discussion about whether you think that's uh, possible and also desirable. So maybe, Victoria, would you like to, to open on that one? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. I did also reference um, Anne Phoenix, who's from the UK, and also um, I referenced Nina, Nina Leakey, who is um, um, also European. So, I mean, that's two people um, which I reference. I, I think it can definitely um, be replicated within um, Europe. However, I, I'll go back to what I've said before, and, and I know you made reference that it was personal, it is personal. Um, intersectionality is personal and political. Um, so for me, for it to be replicated, there needs to be an acknowledgement that gender and, and a person of color connects together and you can't separate it. So you might do a policy on race and you might do a policy on, on gender, but when you're looking at black women, they've got to come together. And I think that's something which we need to look at. Thank you. Uh, Mika, yeah, go ahead. It might seem a bit off topic, but I think also um, I, I learn a lot about intersectionality, not from academic literature, but from fiction. So those of you who like, who like to read fiction, 
what I would really love you to read is a European book. <laughs> it's a British one by Bernardine Evaristo, and it's called Girl, Woman, Other, and it's just absolutely fabulous. And um, I, I think this, this, this is, it's a good way to, to, to acquire a deeper understanding of, of what, what all these, so what Victoria was, was saying, uh, how did you see that? Uh, you were talking about the pain you feel that includes both race, racism and race and gender. I think that that book is, is a very, very beautiful um, and sophisticated way in which all this becomes comes to you through the lives of people in, uh, and that might help as well. And I think another book that I like a lot in, in the European setting is this one um, from Agugo uh, Imiulo and uh, Francesca Salbanda, To Exist is to Resist. And uh, so, I mean, there's, there's more, <laughs> but, uh, but those are books that, that I think might, might open up some space, especially if you if you think you, you, you sit in a totally white environment because there's so few uh, women from, from racialized categories that are, that are moving in your, you know, in the, in the space where you actually see them. And uh, so, so that, that might help as well. Uh, because I think if you, some of the American literature can be especially difficult because the whole understanding of what higher education is functions in such a different way um, than it is for European standards, especially outside of the UK, especially those countries that have hardly any tuition or um, that don't have these resident dorm systems, don't have campuses the way the U US has it. So, so in order to, uh, to unpack that, it's also good to, to read more more European text, but also to, to, to keep in mind when you read analysis about the US that the US system of, of college education is really very specifically American. And then to think that even if, the, if European countries have a little bit more equal um, organization of of higher education, it doesn't mean that they're not excluding people in need. It doesn't mean they're not reproducing systems of, of inequality and oppression through the way that they do that. Um, so so that's, that's maybe also helpful. So Lisa, would you like to offer any input on this question? Yes, perhaps just briefly. I mean, I think I... I... Yeah, as, as Maya Marx Free, for instance, argues, right, that this idea of how context uh, matters, obviously, when we when we discuss how concepts travel and how we try to apply these concepts in in the uh, in different settings in in different contexts. Um, but at the same time, I think there is also um, this comparative value of sort of following also that journey of the concept that travels, right? This is oftentimes what will give us the visibility of the things that we could not see, right? And I think that previously there has been this idea Idea, right of saying okay so when we apply it in the European context then we would focus more on ethnicity and gender for instance but there's there is a very big risk in that as well um, and I think that this is what what is um, yeah happening more in recent years right precisely taking the comparative value and saying okay but but the race issue is so important in the European context as well um, and it's too it's too easy just to make that uh, that uh, argument I guess to say that then we we talk about gender and ethnicity instead right uh, you could say oh that has been sort of a part of the problem at least so i think that we really need to to use that uh, that comparative perspective to be able to see again the things that that have yeah that that are perhaps more difficult to see or what we we haven't been able to see uh, before so following the journey i think is very important with these uh, concepts yeah 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 i i think also following up on on lisa and and uh i i think for me, it always helps to then think of um, what David Goldberg calls different patterns of racialization. So Europe and the different countries within Europe have very different patterns of how they have racialized people. The Netherlands with their colonies in Indonesia and in Suriname and in the Caribbean islands have very different pattern than the Belgians have. I mean, I'm using the, country, the countries that I know, no? 
uh, than the Belgians have with their with their with their with their awful colonization of of Congo, in um, and and some countries pretend they didn't have any colonies, even if some have. No, I mean we have Danish people here, and I do think you still, in my in my view, you still have a colony. I would call Greenland a colony. So um, so in in that sense, um, we're used to. And I think ethnicity as a, as a concept might underplay that uh, because it, it, it's better to ask yourself who are, in the context that I'm working on, who are the people that are racialized? Because race, racialization uh, doesn't only use ethnicity. It can use religion. It can use, it can use whatever, actually. It's very, it's very intriguing, but it has the same dev devastating consequences for the people who are racialized in the category that doesn't belong. And then, then I think you might also have to take a step back. I'm this political scientist, no? So I, I see academia as part of society, right? So you have to, to, to then take a step back and see who are not getting anywhere in the pipeline that leads to university. Who are those people that are already not in the type of secondary education that leads to a university education? Who are the people that, that, that already, I mean, if you look at many of the Eastern European countries, then Roma kids often don't get to that type of secondary education where they could go to university. The Roma people are a specific European pattern of, of racialization. And, and, and those are more prominent in certain contexts than in other contexts, although they are also prominent in Sweden. So, um, in, in that sense, I think to ask yourself the question, how is my society racialized and how is my university not counterbalancing that? No, to the degree that the university can do that, because of course, sometimes the main problem is in the pipeline. But is my university in Nijmegen, are they putting as much attention in recruiting students from the schools, the secondary school, uh, secondary schools where there are more kids with a migrant background than in those where there are more white kids, I think they could improve their behavior on that, right? So um, in, in that sense, I think to ask yourself the question about how, how can you try not to be so uh, complicit or reproducing in the patterns of racialization that are already out there and how might these patterns be different for girls and boys is a good way to, to start looking at it. Thank you. And I might uh, just uh, add a different question now. And I think I would pose it uh, to, um, to Victoria uh, to begin with. So in terms of uh, your, the part of your presentation where you mentioned that uh, often the dominant groups would translate uh, the messages of, of black people and, and people of color into language they're more comfortable with. Would you see, see, say that there's a parallel in terms of, for instance, uh, promoting gender plus or diversity management over intersectional approaches along the, along the lines of what you are arguing? I think I think you're absolutely spot on. I think you're absolutely correct. Um, my particular work at the present moment um, as an academic is that I've also doing the um, I'm chairing Athena Swan, which means that I'm leading my particular faculty through gender equality to be able to get the silver award. Let's just put that to one side. Now, what that means is um, now. Uh, when we're looking at gender and we're looking at gender equality, we're looking at in the main white women. When we're, when we're looking at, and, and now I'm being given that task to um, chair an award, mm -hmm. for us to get an award through an application means that I have to unpack the culture within that faculty, mm -hmm. which is very uncomfortable because they're comfortable with gender, but they're not comfortable with gender and race. Mm -hmm. Now, um, my colleagues have mentioned so far some different things in relation to that. Understanding and taking on board the lived experiences of black women is fundamental. We always, what there seems to be a tendency of is bringing other identities into the mix of what the experience of black women feel. Mm 
Yes, there are other people which are also um, feeling different aspects and need to be included in the intersectional part. I'm standing for the fact that, that if I look at the United Kingdom, the people which are in the United Kingdom which are black have been in the United Kingdom since the 17th century. And to be called a migrant is, is just becoming un, un, unacceptable. To, to be feeling in an organization that you need to be tolerated is also unacceptable. I'll give you an, um, a, a little bit of statistics. So I'm just gonna look at our university, which is an elite establishment. We have just over 8,600 academics in the university, academics. I ask you the question, how many academics look like me, including me, um, are in that particular university? Now I put you out your misery, it's 17, one seven out of just over 8,600 academics in Jesus. that university, in that university. Now, if we look across the country, and we then focus only on professors, not academics like myself, who will be an associate professor, um, there is only 85 in the whole of the country. So what does that look like when you're to asking me about gender plus and policies and everything else? Well, uh, if you then go to places like France, if I may, they don't actually take data on race because everybody's French. So how do they then look at the experiences? Going back to the UK, and we then think about, okay, so we've got 90, 85 to 90 academics in, in the UK. What does that actually mean? It means that, oh, it doesn't mean meritocracy, they're not working hard enough. Does it mean this? No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. What it means is you're not allowing people in the house. Mm -hmm. And I use the term a house, I'm writing at the moment, I've got a book which needs to be published to, called Managing Everyday Racism it, through an intersectional lens. It's about understanding. I noticed in the chat, and I just a couple of seconds and I'll and I shut up. Mm -hmm. But in the chat, somebody mentioned about um, the, um, the lack of progression that women make because of caring responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. The lack of progression that black women have is because of discrimination. It's as, it's as bold, and as blatant as that. You have to ask yourself the question, why is it that some academics who've been in the system for maybe 14 years, 15 years, are still at the same position? Whereas other academics have been flying off and they've become a professor within five years of doing their, um, um, doing their actual um, doctorate. And that's a really key question. They may also look like me. If you are international and you're black, you get a different you get a different leg up. If you're not international, but you come from home school, you've been schooled in the country, the same thing which African Americans experience as well. You don't progress because people don't have this paternal way of thinking. Well, you've come from that country, so of course we need to give you a little bit more. Whereas a person who's living in the country doesn't get that, and I think that's really important. That's why the notion of intersectionality isn't is an approach for me it's an approach and theory is within it it's because of what is do, what is the lived experience and what are you actually doing so I've, I've spoken a little bit too much but you know I'm trying to catch up that's completely okay thank you very much for your input uh Lisa you have something to add yes I I just wanted to I mean about this this um uh, yeah, thing about how uh, yeah talking in language that is familiar um, to the dominant group. I think that this is a yeah, it's a very uh, classical, very typical mechanism of power, right? Every time, I mean, in all processes, we try to speak to power. There is this uh, um, there is this dynamic of how you gain influence through resonance, right? You you try to create a resonant uh, language, or you have to create a resonance language in, in order to to be able to uh, to influence. And I think this is where it's so important that we, I mean to me and you asked the question about sort of what what is then different here about intersectionality right or how does it compare and this is where this aspect of privilege is is so uh, is so important right that we have to try to or yeah somehow um reverse that right so talk about what i mean who who is in power and what what kind of power are we speaking to who hold uh, these privileges and um, and i think actually that 
the question, Victoria, that you had um, in your first presentation about who, who am I, right? I mean, this is basically, and I guess, Mika, what you said just before, this is basically the question we have to ask on an individual level, at the university level, at the society level, I mean, who who are we, right? Or or who or what is who is this uh, university if we were to define that, um, and and the society as well. Um, and and to me, the question then becomes that when we ask that question and we try to sort of make that analysis, the the difference for me in intersectionality. I, I mean, I acknowledge that diversity management can be done in different ways as well. But to me, the difference about intersectionality is that it asks the the um, what's called Called unconvenient, inconvenient questions, um, and those questions have to do with uh, with privilege, right? And about the, and and they have to do with this mechanism of power, which I think lies behind uh, behind this whole question of which la which language should we should we speak? Thank you so much. Uh, I see that there are some questions uh, or a topic that kind of is recurrent in the chat, which is about indicators. So I see one comment uh, or one question which reads. How to analyze intersectionality in research, uh, uh, in research and university levels? So, good practice indicators. Do any of you have any input here? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, go ahead, Mika. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a very important question and one that is often a bit overlooked because it's it's, uh, it's there's already so much to do when you look at the people in university, no, the people who are in the staff, the people who are students students there but also when it comes to research there is lots of uh, questions asked and maybe um, the easiest way to to look at it is to to think about um, to think about research as as a, a continuous process of making decisions what it's what is important to know and what do we know and what do we actually not know and why is it important to fix a gap that we have identified. And if you realize that we're all sitting in these universities that, that function based on all these inequality systems, then you can start from the hypothesis that probably what you think is important in research has been colored by this as well. So, so what the, the way, you know, I'm, I'm sitting often in panels um, for social sciences, mostly um to grade research proposals right so they will they will have typically in the last years a lot of proposals on migration or a lot of proposals nowadays on far-right politics or um all those uh proposals are, are permeated by an understanding of what is crucial to know right now in our societies and, and but those questions are asked from a certain perspective. So to to look into what is this perspective uh, from which we look at research? How do we make decisions? What is important to know? Right. Lastly, I was trying to find out more about these racialization patterns in the Nordic countries with Sami people with the Greenland people. And for some reason, I can't find substantial research about that. Why is that? Why is that not important? I do find quite some research in these countries about migration to these countries and racialization patterns related to this migration to these countries. But there is endemic, there is indigenous patterns of racialization in these countries with whole histories in there, and they're not looked at. Similarly, for the Netherlands, you'll find much more research on, um, on migration related topics on, on racism than you find about all these post colonial elements uh, of Dutch history. So, why is that? What are we missing there? So in social science and humanities, I think there is definitely a very strong intersectional bias on class, on gender. Um, if you look at history, they, they had been remedied a little bit. At some point it started to think, ah, history shouldn't be only about how the inter kings interacted with each other and started wars against each other. It should also be about the history of, of everyday people. 
right? But who then were these everyday people? At the beginning, these were definitely not the enslaved people by the Dutch. So, so there is a very strong bias and we need to be aware of that. I'm not a specialist in the STEM uh, sciences, so I cannot say much about that, but in social science and humanities, there is definite, definitely, uh, let's say a white perspective to this. There is a heterosexual perspective to many elements and you can, and there is a masculine uh, bias towards many of these things and it still can be improved. So to, to, to counterbalance that, maybe you need to do some shock actions, no? Maybe you need to, to say next year, we will only award our internal money for extra research to research that actually does something about that. And the rest is not eligible this year. So um, I, I, I think it's, by, it's because all universities are continuously deciding who to give money and who not to give money, who to give research time and who to not give research time. So if you connect back to people, you can also do something on this, this intersectional uh, inequality concerning research by asking like, who are the people that could really bring us a lot by giving them a leg up and giving them extra research time? The people that we have already here, the people that have uh, had to, to jump through lots of hoops and over lots of hurdles to get where they are. Maybe we give them a leg up for a couple of years to do some extra research and we'll see what comes of that, right? So you can do many things. Thank you, Mika. Thank you for your, for your reply. And Victoria, I'll pass it on to you, but I wanted to also ask, you can give your comment the one you wanted to, to give, but I might also ask in terms of indicators, how you work with that uh, from an intersectional perspective in, in relation to Athena Swan, if you can give some uh, experience from that perhaps. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the question I wanted to ask, well, not a question, the point I wanted to make is, I, I think we need to reflect on is how do we, how do we view data? I ask that because it's always the same discussion that the, the numbers are too small, um, and I'm thinking about the chat here, the numbers are too small, which means that we can't uh, uh, carry out surveys or do um, interviews because it will identify people. Well, that will mean you'll never ever do anything because the numbers are always going to be small if you don't let people into the place. So I, I think that's an important point. Another point is, um, do you when you ask the questions, do you are you ready for the answers? And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. When you ask the questions, are you ready for the answers? And if so, does that mean that you want to put the resources in for change? That you want transformation to take place? Transformation meaning that, um, that where you've normally hired somebody that looks like you, you're ready to hire somebody who doesn't look like you. Where you've always hired somebody, perhaps who's got three books, 10 articles, 20 articles, whatever, and has the experience. Are you ready to hire somebody in a position where perhaps you might need to give them a little bit of support because they've not had access to that support? Are you ready to do that? Because I know you're ready to do it if it's white women. You'll mm. say, well, as a woman, you've had care and responsibilities or you've had this, you've had that, etc. But are you ready to do that for a black woman? And, I, and, I, and I'd really question that. Are you ready to do that? If not, don't bother. Don't, don't put the pain, don't put people through the pain of then getting an interview, of doing X, Y, and Z, and you're really not ready to do it, you just want to see them perform on the day. Um, that's that's a, a challenge to hear. Now, the question you asked about in relation to, um, actually, say your question again for me, Lisa, uh, e not Lisa, it's yourself, sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. don't worry about it. Um, so I just wanted to take the, the question about indicators. Maybe you have some experiences on thinking about intersectional indica indicators from Athena Swan. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we very well, I mean, I wasn't involved in the first part. I was in Ireland, but not this part, which was the bronze. And where that meant that, um, that um, my, my particular faculty, because don't forget the UCL does it big wise, um, looked at doing a bronze and the, and the action plan 
produced a mass, fantastic action plan. And then of course, um, and we received it, but then of course, um, pandemic took place. I say that in context. So now I'm picking up the silver, the indicators themselves are what we're thinking about, what we're working with is how we, I'm bringing in an intersectional approach to that. They didn't use an intersectional. They were trying to, but at the time Athena Swan wasn't actually using it. So the indicators for me are, um, are really ensuring that the culture, so we're looking at the culture, I'm looking at the culture and the, the me, i.e. the person in this is really important because you can have an organization or the faculty can be fantastic at doing, um, to being the best at what they're doing, but how miserable are the staff? So I'm looking at well-being. So well-being is really, really something which is coming in. Um, Lisa, I would also offer you a chance to, to answer the question about indicators, if you have anything to add. No, I think yeah, both Victoria and Mika um, covered that, but maybe just one, one follow-up on what Victoria said, because I, I think that's very important, this idea about, you know, of course, asking the questions, but are we then ready for the answers, right? And I think oftentimes, again, if I look sort of to, to my own context um, or university context, I think, for instance, this idea of putting in um, search committees in order to, to, um, to open up sort of the space for, uh, for hiring, um, considering a diversity and, and also intersectionality, um, in this regard, I think that is precisely one area where we can see this, that, that perhaps we're ready to ask the questions, so we're ready to put out uh, these kinds of mechanisms and these kinds of um, yeah, structures to, uh, to try to diversify the field of applicants, but, but most, most of the time we're not ready for the answers, right? We're not ready to uh, then actually also hire, as you said, Victoria, so hire um, in, uh, within this uh, setting as well. So I think that's really, um, yeah, that's a really good uh, point and a really good um, question, yeah, to to uh, bear in mind um, when we um, when we also let's say um, put uh, into practice these uh, these measures and again sort of the difference between doing it for show sure and and actually wanting to change institutional structures. Thank you very much. So we only have probably time for one final question before we have to round off the discussion. So I, I will apologize to all the participants who've added their questions that we won't be able to cover. Um, but I do see some comments on uh, thinking in terms of other dimensions of intersectionality, so age questions and precarious employment or uh, LGBTQ plus people, uh, disabilities and so on. So I wondered if any of you would have anything uh, to add um, in relation or in addition to what we've been discussing, discussing mainly around gender and race until now. Yeah, I, I think Lisa should, should say something about age, no, Lisa? And uh, I mean, maybe I can I can say something about sexuality as well. And uh, I had mentioned something, uh, th this wonderful book on white innocence by Gloria Becker already, but uh, actually she has a book before that in Dutch, for those of you who can read that, uh, which if you translate the title means, I'm a golden coin, I pass through many hands, I always keep my value. It's about sexuality and women in, uh, um, so, so it's, I, I think it's, um, in, in many ways, uh, universities have moved, uh, ahead. My university in the seventies, when I studied, had a famous, uh, lesbian professor that wasn't allowed to bring her partner to, to official academic events, Andreas Burnier or Ronnie Dessauer. Uh, she was a fiction writer and a criminology professor. Uh, they have moved. Uh, on for that, from that, but not all universities in Europe have. And uh, in many universities, uh, lesbian and gay students are, are just still uh, more or less in the closet. So there is still a lot, and I mean, some of them are in countries that really do awful things to them. So um, th there is still also this, this need to, to think through uh, sexuality in its intersections with gender and with race. Um, at universities and to make sure, and, and I think for, as a good start for, for this and uh, intersectionally is the question, who is safe on this campus? Who is safe? Uh, because it will give you some kind of understanding and who is safe at what time of the day and who is safe in what kind of uh, interactions, uh, in what kind of practices. I think this is a good question also to, to like who can walk around when the lights are out and, and not be bothered. 
uh, neither by security people or by other people that might be around. Who, who, can, who can be a student for which professor and not be in danger of sexual harassment? Uh, so I think those are all good questions to, that also will bring up issues of age and sexuality and race and gender at the same time, I think. Thank you, and uh, I will follow Mika's suggestion and pass it on to Lisa. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, gender and age, I think uh, precisely, I mean, this is this is where we can, I mean, with that intersection, you could say this is where we can see these different policy fields, uh, in my opinion, uh, coming together. And one thing that I think it's important to bear in mind here is that, as we have talked about now, right, discrimination, lack of, of discrimination as a kind of privilege. And I think in relation to gender and age, what is important to think about is how um, independence actually becomes a major privilege, I think, because independence um, in terms of the intersection of gender and age, it works in different levels, right? So it works um, in terms of, of the contractual relations, the precarious uh, nature of, uh, of the work oftentimes, um, also in terms of, uh, of the care roles and in terms of the power structures uh, within, uh, within in the organization. So these are sort of three different elements of, uh, of uh, different forms of dependence or different forms um, or different aspects of dependence in my opinion. So, so sort of paying attention to or being aware of the fact that independence is a major privilege uh, as well. I think that's important when we analyze gender and age uh, intersections. Um, and uh, again, as Mika mentioned also, the, the example obviously of, uh, of, uh, of sexual harassment is, is um, also one place where we can see this, right? Where, where these different elements, again, the, the precarious nature of the contracts, um, the power relations, et cetera, where they come to, to the fore, uh, um, and where we would have to think about these uh, three different forms or three different dimensions of dependence um, in order to uh, to actually make good uh, intersectional policies on that. Thank you. Victoria, do you want to have a final comment as well? Yes, yeah, a final comment, yes. Um, I think I'll go back to what I've said, which is um, I think you can look at all of those, whether you look at gender, age, LGBT, LGBTQ+, whether you look at disability and class, class runs through all of them as well. But as a black woman and who is um, not 20, um, who is older, and um, when you're looking at um, your own sexuality and what that means as well, uh, people, people. If you're if you're a young black woman, it's seen as you know this this pretty type of aspect. You've got this sexualization because sexualization of black women is 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 what is seen as black women. You've also got the um, the kind of de the dehumanization of um, black women as well when you're thinking about age um, and what that means. I mean, and and we think about somebody like um, Moira Stewart. Moira Stewart was a, a, a presenter on the BBC. And she was the same, near the same age as Trevor MacDonald. That when she got to an older age of, of older, of 50 plus, um, she was seen as not viable to be on TV. Now that happens to white women and black women, but it's just one thing as a, as a black woman. But as a black male, he continued to be on TV presenting as long as he wanted until he was unable to perhaps present as that far. So you've got those two things coming in as well. What is pleasing to the eye um, in relation to um, age and also sexuality and also um, race. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. And I think I'll also say intersectionality is, is complex. However, it's, it's an approach which needs to be used on everything we do. And, and also you need to mention Audre Lord because of course, and I put that in the chat. Okay, great. I think we'll have to wrap it up the discussion for now. Um, this was really, uh, really interesting. And thank you for the questions and thank you for the, the very valuable insights from the panelists. So um, I'm not going to say a whole lot as a, as a final comment. I just, uh, as a theme that, that kind of stood out to me throughout this discussion was the question of questions, I think. Um, so uh, asking the right questions when we do this work. So uh, Victoria, you started out with the one that was, who am I looking into the mirror and actually uh, you know, facing your own uh, um, uh, privileges and, and so on, your, your, st your standpoint in, in the world. Also the questions of uh, who are we as a university, as a, an in a research institution and also as a society, which also really uh, resonates uh, with uh, Mika's point about looking into our, our histories, for instance, of colonization. Um, and then about uh, also wanting to ask the inconvenient questions, the uncomfortable questions, also, uh, whether we have a willingness to actually 
hear the answers once we are, once we get them and, and act on those answers, which are of course about power and privilege. And I also was struck by um, uh, a central question, which I also agree with you, Victoria, is also emerging in the context that I'm uh, confronted with, with, which is this idea of well-being be, being a, a topic that's emerging as a focus uh, in terms of also working with uh, gender diversity and intersectional issues at uh, universities. And I also really uh, appreciated your final question you raised, Nika, who is safe at campus and safe in which ways? So I think that there are so many interesting questions and, and I think also this discussion really just leaves, leaves room for it plenty more discussion and I hope uh, I hope we'll get the chance to either continue this discussion in our second part of the session. Thank you everybody then. Thank you so much everyone. Bye bye.